So if you remember way back to last week, you might recall that we talked about Noah and his archiarchy. This week, we're fast-forwarding just shy of about 400 years to, well, when a guy named Abram got his name changed to Abraham. Now, Abram has a pretty interesting story, as stories go. He uh, starts out in what's called Ur of the Chaldeans, which is pretty much in southeastern, the southeastern part of modern-day Iraq. Um, I actually had some friends that were, in, they were stationed over there were able to see the ruins of Ur, which was kind of cool, and then I got to see their pictures, and it was neat for me, but the ruins are all quite exposed and really pretty cool looking if you're ever bored and on the internet and just search for Ur, and you'll see these really cool little ruins. Anywho, God shows up on his doorstep one day and says, hey, guess what you're going to do? You're going to go. And I'm going to tell you where you're going later. If you ever read that bit in the beginning, it's, you know, God shows up and says, go to a land that I'm going to show you, which pretty much means just start walking and I'll tell you when to stop, which is pretty much what Abraham did, except when he stopped in a place called Haran, which is a town on the border between modern-day Turkey and Syria. He didn't quite make it to where God wanted him to be. And when you really look at it, he actually, when he finally did start walking again from Haran, he went through the land that will become the promised land and ended up in Egypt where, um, in order to not get himself killed, he told Pharaoh that Sarah was his sister and... Then Egypt got some boils and other sorts of unpleasantness. And it's a really neat story. Now, what's interesting about Abram, more than just that he pretty much up and left when God told him to, is there's not really any evidence that he knew this God who is called the Lord. And know that God, the Lord isn't really God's real name, of course. It's just the only name that we have for him because the way to say God's name has been lost to history. And yet God still showed up with this random guy in Ur and said, go. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to make you a a great nation too. Just, you know, throwing that out there. Go and I'll make you a great nation. And Abram gets up and goes. He heads down to Cana. He has some misadventures, uh, including when he, at the age of 75, was starting to think, oh, maybe God's promise isn't going to come true, and I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And, uh, well, Ishmael happened. And then we end up at today's reading not too long after. Um, God shows up at Abram's doorstep yet again, and this time says, I think you need a little bit of a reminder about what I told you before. You are going to be the father of many nations, And to prove it, I'm changing your name. You're not Abram anymore, which means exalted father, but instead you're called Abraham, the father of many. And oh, by the way, by this time next year, your wife Sarah is going to have a son. Now that last part gives Abraham a pretty good giggle because she's 80-something at this point. And God showed up and said, she's going to have a kid. (laughs) But even then, even when stuff made Abraham laugh, he still trusted God. Even when stuff didn't always make a lot of sense to him. In fact, he got so good at trusting God that in the book of Romans, Paul uses him as an example of faith. Abraham is who Paul uses to illustrate that we're not saved by the things we do, but instead by putting our trust in God and God saying that we are saved. And now we, now we Christians should look to Abraham to see how we should live our lives as we follow Jesus Christ. And the, in the same way that God called Abraham righteous, he also calls us righteous because of the things that Jesus did.
namely dying on the cross and, raising from the, and rising again from the dead. One of the key aspects of this kind of faith that we now have and that Abraham had is this idea of, that Luther calls remembering our baptism. This is going to come up a lot this Lent. I'm going to promise you this already. Because the whole idea is when Luther talks about remembering our baptism, it means that we, every day, deny ourselves and follow Christ. Every day, sometimes more often. For me, it has to be more often. Because what we do when we live in faith is we're no longer living for ourselves and living for our own selfish desires. Instead, we're living for what God has for us to do. This is exactly what Jesus starts to teach the people gathered around him after, well, Peter resoundingly puts his foot in his mouth. Because this scene from our gospel when Jesus is talking about this is right after Peter says something really smart. And he immediately backs it up by saying something really, really dumb. Which is kind of what Peter does. So Peter, or Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, what are people saying about me? They say, oh, well, some people say that you're Elijah. Some people say you're another one of the prophets. Some people even say you're John the Baptist. And then Jesus says, well, okay, who... Who do you guys think I am then? It's like, and Peter goes, oh, well, you're the Christ. Now, Jesus, realizing this, carries on to start talking about what it is that the Christ is going to do. Namely, that he is going to die on a cross and rise again in three days. So what does Peter do? He pulls Jesus aside and says, whoa, tiger. This isn't how this works. We're not going to let this happen. That's pretty presumptuous of Peter, isn't it? To think that his idea of what the Messiah is is better than the person who, just, who he just said is the Messiah? This is, it boggles the mind. And then, of course, Peter gets called out by Jesus who goes so far as to call him Satan. And then Jesus tells the crowd, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And it's in that statement that Jesus reminds us that following God isn't always easy. If we're really to follow Jesus, we have to be willing to give up our lives in that faith. That's what Jesus is saying to these people. But we're called as Christians to live our lives in a way that reflects a love of God and a love of our neighbor. It's a faith that's deeper than just believing that God exists, that he's some guy floating on a cloud with a really big, long, white beard. That's all great and whatever, yay, you believe in God. James says, even the demons do that and they shudder at it, so... Good for you. Faith is more than that. It's more than just thinking that God exists. It's making a commitment to trust him in every situation and to put him higher than we put ourselves. And it's that kind of faith that makes us children of Abraham participating in the same promise that God makes and then being called righteous in his eyes, not by our works, but by the faith that leads us to deny ourselves and follow God.